grew up in Sadr, the heart of Karachi, in a two-roomed apartment that did not have electricity. There were three generations of us living in that tiny space. And yet, some of my fondest memories date back to this time. I remember the smell of salt and moongphali spreading like wildfire in the winter. I remember running barefoot in the bazaar, the loud shopkeepers, the chattering chaiwalas, the Farsi women in their beautiful dresses. I remember curling up around a book my parents had gotten me, a prized possession, cramming by candlelight for yet another exam. It was a time rich in color and in diversity. But there are other less fond memories as well. I remember walking to and back from school, a long distance because we couldn't afford transport. The torn soles of my shoes, the cruel kids at school who would point them out, laugh at them, cheer, whisper. I remember a classmate showing up unexpectedly at my house, the curiosity in her eyes when she asked, but where do you all sleep? My embarrassed responding silence because even at seven, I realized that other people I knew did not sleep on the floor. I remember having to watch my parents collect my Taya's dead body from an ED center because we couldn't afford to get him to a hospital. From the streets of Sadr to the snow-capped spires of Syracuse, from Empress Market to upstate New York, my life career journey has been a roller coaster in the dynamics of power, of privilege, of poverty. It has taught me about confidence and courage, about compassion and character. But what it has taught me more than anything else is this. All of us, all of us can change someone's life. All of us hold the power. We can all give someone the inspiration, the courage, the assistance to become a superstar. I'm here today to share three lessons I've learned on my journey about creating a society that empowers everyone who is part of it. The first lesson is this. We must remove the shame from poverty and the applause from privilege. I'm going to share a short story with you, the story of how I learned about branding in business school. I had a marketing instructor, a lovely man, by the way, who thought that it was okay to go to the front of that class, stand at the front of the class, and tell us, let's talk about what a mehran represents about its owners. If somebody shows up in a mehran, we automatically know that they're not from such a good family, they're not that classy, they're not that sophisticated, they're not that well-groomed. Now, this was the year that my parents had finally saved up enough money after years of trying to mortgage a small mehran. Their first car, our crowning glory. It was the year that I could finally stop having to walk 20 minutes to a bus stop and then change two public buses to get to some of my classes. And so I remember this in excruciating detail. I remember every word of the class discussion that followed all the students collectively pulling in unsavory details of what that car represented about its owners. For months afterwards, I obsessed about showing up to college in that car. I would arrive at 7 a.m. an hour before classes started because I was so terrified that someone would see me, that once again, just like my childhood, people would point me out, laugh, whisper, snicker. That one class discussion it impacted my morale, my self-esteem, my productivity, my output for years to come. I can tell you this today, although I couldn't have told you this back then. Not one student in that class intended to be unkind. My marketing instructor did not intend to be unkind. It had just never occurred to them that the words they were saying could cause such soul-crushing embarrassment. It had just never occurred to them because we do not think about it, that they were stigmatizing a lack of privilege or applauding an abundance of it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, shaming people for a lack of privilege is part and parcel of our social fabric. 
All of us participate in this shaming every day. When we put down a server for his or her job, when we refuse to treat a janitor with the same respect as the CEO, when we use that common phrase, masi lagreyo, to ridicule someone's appearance. This shaming stops millions of people from reaching their full potential. So if we want to create a society where everyone is empowered, we must first create a society where people can reach out for help without shame or fear. This brings me to my second lesson. We must maintain the dignity of those who reach out for assistance. The first time I applied for financial aid, I went through a process I can only label as traumatizing. Just a kid, I was made to sit through interview after interview where grown men with zero training in empathy or sensitivity asked me invasive, horrible, and mostly unnecessary questions about everything from my family's living arrangement to my parents' marriage. At one point, I was asked, and I quote, if you come from such a pathetic family, why did you apply at all? This was not meant to be a degrading comment, no. It was a genuine question from someone who had never had to reach out for help, and so did not understand the responsibilities of those who facilitate assistance. But it was not these negative experiences that taught me the power of those who provide assistance. I learned from my interaction with Esan Trust, which gave me an interest-free loan to pursue my higher education from the dignity and seriousness which characterized the evaluation process. I learned from my journey with Fulbright, which placed me in Syracuse to pursue public administration, from the love, the respect, the overwhelming understanding with which they treated me from day one and with which they continue to treat me today. I learned from Robert Moret, my professor of defense strategy at Syracuse University who funded a college trip I could not have personally afforded because he believed in my potential to benefit from it. I learned from my mother, who slept on the floor so her children could sleep on the only bed in that house of eight people because she believed it would help us do well in school. It was these positive experiences that allowed me to graduate from Pakistan's best business school to attend the U.S.'s top-ranked public administration program, to work as a management trainee at Standard Chartered, to be speaking here today, to be spearheading today our transformational youth leadership program that impacts hundreds of children. The individuals who propelled me forwards, they were not gods, they were regular folk like you and I. But what they did with the power that they had change the trajectory of my life. So if you want to create a society that empowers everyone, all of us must harness the power that we have and transfer it to others. This leads me to the last lesson, the one with which I began this talk. All of us hold the power to change someone's life. I'm sure you've heard this a million times before, countless times, yes? But how often have you thought about it? How often have you thought actively about the power that you possess, the responsibilities it places on your shoulder, the opportunities it unlocks for you? The truth is that each one of you, that I, all of us, do hold that power, the power to empower hundreds of other people. We are part every single day of a million interactions that can crush someone's spirit or lift them up for life. It was one comment in one college class that had me hiding in fear and embarrassment for months. It was one interview in one financial aid process that broke me for such a long time. I'm standing here right now and it still hurts me today. Being that young kid with no one to turn to, being told to my face that my family is pathetic because they're not rich. It was one idea, the idea that my sister would stay awake with me that allowed me to stay up night after night until 3 a.m. after working multiple part-time jobs so I could finish my assignments and get through IBA 
with a stellar GPA. It was one scholarship from one organization that has equipped me to be here today, to today be cultivating, harnessing the potential, the imagination, the ambition of hundreds of children. Listen, listen, you can be that one person, that one parent, that one sibling, that one interviewer, that one organization. You can create that one process. I urge you to think about it because I promise you, I promise you, there are people out there who've been waiting for your help. Thank you.